Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Coin Brief Podcast, episode number 25. Uh, this is your open source for digital currency news. We talk about the latest uh, developments in the cryptocurrency space every week. And this week we have a new smorgasbord of news and developments for you in the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency industry and community. So what we're going to start with today is a new bill that was submit submitted to Congress uh, this, this week by Congressman Steve Stockman from Texas. He's a Republican. And the bill is called the Cryptocurrency Protocol Protection and Moratorium Act. And it aims to basically set a five-year period, a moratorium, on any further Bitcoin regulations uh, that could be enacted in the future by the Congress of the United States. So this is a really surprising development. We have a congressman who is putting out a a like um, a bill that wants to protect cryptocurrency from bad regulation before it comes out uh, and hurts it in the first place. So what do you think, Evan, about this fact that uh, a congressman has actually come out as a staunch defender of cryptocurrency kind of out of nowhere really i i wouldn't say he wants to he wants to prevent bad regulation from happening it seems like with the with the five-year moratorium on any regulation whatsoever it seems like what's his name Stockman. congressman stockman uh steve stockman it seems like he just wants to He's curious to see where it'll go, and he recognizes that regulating it too early in any capacity might stunt its growth or even kill it before it's strong enough to be – before comp the companies are big enough and funded enough uh, to comply with these regulations. So I, I wouldn't say that he's the staunch advocate of a – free bitcoin market he just doesn't want to take the risk of killing it by regulating it too early i'm sure after the five years is up he would be all for any kind of financial regulations on bitcoin mm -hmm. but the fact that he just wants to leave it alone for five years is a re would be a really great opportunity for bitcoin if it passed because five years in internet time that's that's, that's a, like yeah, a, it's really long. It's like a century, so anything could happen between then. In five years, Bitcoin could become regulation proof. Maybe yeah. we'll have this huge innovation that just makes it impossible to pin anyone down who's breaking Bitcoin. It, I think it's really unlikely that it would actually pass, though. But it's cool that it's actually becoming popular enough or people are becoming aware so aware of it that congressmen are proposing legislation in the house of representatives yeah like it's not it's not the senate by any means you know the senate is the major leagues that's where the big stuff goes down that'd be bigger but news if a senator had proposed this bill the, the house of representatives that's that's still the federal government so it's pretty it's pretty amazing to see how far we've come just since i've got into the the whole cryptocurrency space back in the summer when I got into it, I wouldn't have dreamed that people would be submitting legislation, proposing bills on the house floor. So this is pretty interesting. Yeah. And yeah. he specifically mentions New York, uh, in, in the regulatory framework, or uh, he's said in the past that New York is putting the cart before the horse referring to the bit license regulations that Ben Lasky proposed as part of the New York Department of Financial Services. And it, it seems like uh, he is aware that this is a rapidly changing space, a rapidly changing industry. Like you said, a lot, a lot can happen in five years. That's a century in the internet time and maybe even a millennium in <laughs> cryptocurrency time. Uh, this space changes so much week to week, month to month, and year by year. Like, who really knows what this space will look like in, in five years? It's possible that Bitcoin might not even be around in five years. This uh, whole project might uh, 
mining centralization might become too big of a problem and people move on to a different blockchain to work on like we we have no idea what's going to happen in three to four or five years so it's really i think it's really good that the idea of just setting a five-year moratorium and like okay government has no idea how to deal with this just tell them to not deal with it for five years and see what happens to the space this is still a very rudimentary uh, protocol that doesn't have a lot of good user phasing app user facing applications but those will come in time in in a couple years so why not just wait for a couple years for those developments to come and one specific really good example is how starting in 2014 you start seeing exchanges do proof of reserves for how much money they actually hold uh, in their exchange. In the Mt. Gox days you just had to take them at their word and trust them and trust Mark Carpelis that he holds everyone's money that he says he does and we all know how well that turned out. But now that we've seen that like huge colossal failure happen uh, there's been actual technological advances to come out that show that allow a, an institution to unequivocally show how much money they actually have show that they do have a hundred and four percent a hundred three percent of of users funds there we talked about this before Huobi, OK coin other exchanges have done stuff like this to prove it so that's that's a form of like self-regulation that can't be really imposed by regulators. You wouldn't see government proposing that type of thing because the government has no idea what a cryptographic proof is. So you, you see those type of, types of things happening and as things like multisig get even more advanced that'll provide even even more self-regulation to happen in the space. So yeah I mean it's it's a great it's a great idea to to put forward in Congress but I also agree with you on the other point that I don't think it's really, I don't think it really has a chance of going anywhere in, in the in the Congress. Uh, we see that Congress is so divided and gridlocked on, you know, bipartisan issues that typically would get passed in a heartbeat, but they find something to disagree on and will disagree with each other and vote against each other just to play politics and. I highly doubt that a cryptocurrency bill would be able to surpass those divisions and somehow get a majority of House representatives on its side. So, yeah. I think it'll be a while before we get any federal legislation pro or against Bitcoin just because it's so new and people, like, let's be honest, people in Congress are are just really old and behind the times, which one of the reasons why the government sucks so bad. But they they just people just to really understand what it is. Even the people who have like dedicated all of their free time to Bitcoin don't even completely understand what it is. So it's there's a really big learning curve to something just as revolutionary and unheard of, unprecedented as Bitcoin is. So I think what we'll see for the next few years, I can't say exactly how many, I'm just speculating next couple of years, we'll see states play with legislation and regulation more. And then once, I think the, I think the federal government will, one, they'll look to the Federal Reserve to see what they think about Bitcoin, and then they'll see what the states are doing, and then they'll try to, then they'll start trying to come up with their own national regulation on it yeah yeah so uh also to add to the cynical point that i made earlier i want to mention jim harper's tweet uh that was included in the, in the coindesk article he says uh this is the global policy advisor for the bitcoin foundation he says don't get too excited this was introduced at the end of congress by a departing member so apparently steve stockman isn't even going to return to Congress next year. I don't know if he was uh, voted out or if he's just resigning, but it's not like he's up for re-election. That's, you know, he doesn't have anything to, to risk. And it's great that he's a fan of cryptocurrencies, but in the current political climate of Congress, 
and the federal government, uh, that's the only way you can do a risky proposition like that is if you aren't coming back next year anyway. On your way out. Right, right. So uh, on another side of regulation, um, you mentioned that specific states are going to attempt regulation first before the federal government is likely to do that. So California uh, could very well be next on that list after Kansas, Texas, and New York. Uh, it's been announced that California is going to hold a debate in uh, the California Department of Business Oversight, and they're going to talk about what kind of options they have for regulating Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, and whether you know whether California law even gives them uh, oversight over that, whether they're even able to do that lawfully. Uh, earlier this year, they passed a revision to the California code, the business code, uh, basically saying that Bitcoin is lawful money. It can be used in trade and commerce on the same level as gift cards and rewards points and other types of proprietary virtual currencies. So we already know it's lawful, it's legal to use, but now they're thinking about what other potential regulations they could do and whether they have the power to do that. Um, Evan, are you, are you optimistic about, uh, about California's approach to this, or are you kind of, you think it's going to lead to more New York style, um, regulations? Well, it's California. So of course I'm not optimistic about it, but this goes back to what I said last week about my speculation that in 2015 we would start seeing a lot more regulatory clarity in the United States if not around the world and California's a pretty big state especially in Silicon Valley with technology so of course they're going to be putting their two cents on their two cents in on Bitcoin um I don't from what I understand is going to be about it's they're not proposing act, any actual regulation they're just trying to figure out what they can do and it's it's i think it's good that there are states that are already thinking about this trying to find out what they can do in regards to bitcoin and that's going to be it's going to be really important in 2015 the more the more states realize that bitcoin is something that they should pay attention to and they need to decide what they're going to do with it whether or not me and you agree with their decisions and the laws they decide to pass on it regulatory uh clarity is a really important factor in uh bringing in new investment which will increase the price and stabilize it so mm -hmm. i'm glad to see some possible evidence that my prediction might come true that we'll get some clarification on the legal status of Bitcoin in the United States. And I think regardless of whether or not it's good or bad, in my opinion, I, you know, favor anything that promotes the free market, but even if it's, uh, restrictive, at least, at least the government has, the governments have taken an official stance on it and people know what they can what they can expect in the future from it. So they might be more willing to invest in it, mm -hmm. even if there is bad legislation on the books. So that's what I think about it. Yeah. yeah. And you know, yeah. this is really is it... early stages for yeah. California, yeah. at least like they're just going to hold a meeting. They're going to talk about the possibilities and they're definitely still keeping an eye on other States that are further ahead in this process. Basically new uh, California's, regulatory agency is about at the same stage as New York was a year ago because about this time New York started thinking about okay let's let's start drafting the bit license regulations and see what, what that'll look like and then Mt. Gox happened and and then you see the the crazy far-reaching regulations that the bit license eventually turned into so we'll have to wait and see what California actually does with this so we'll we'll be following that for sure um, so another, uh, speaking of the New York bit license, 
a pretty surprising move that uh, department financial whiz, whiz kid uh, Ben Lasky did this week. He did a pretty open, transparent move by releasing all of the comments that were made on the bit license that were sent to the department. He released them all to the public. They're all online. You can read what everyone thinks of the bit license. There's like hundreds, actually like thousands of comments to sift through. And there's some really interesting comments on the bit license. Um, three of the most interesting ones, um, not just, you know, there's, of course, there's, there's all the pro Bitcoin people who are talking about the bit license goes too far and it'll hurt innovation, hurt businesses, hurt economic freedom. But some surprising submissions came from Amazon and Walmart, uh, for example, who actually thought that the bit license goes too far and could actually classify their proprietary gift cards and rewards points as virtual currencies that would be regulated under the bit license. So they're sending letters to Ben Lasky telling him, hey, uh, uh, these regulations are far reaching. We don't even deal with digital currencies and Bitcoin and stuff, but you know, your, your language, your legal language is so broad, so vague that it could encompass our our own gift cards and stuff. So like that's I mean that's that's that tells a lot about the nature of the bit license regulations and how far reaching they are in their in their scope that they could actually wind up affecting Amazon and Walmart, these huge retailers who have huge market shares. Yeah, and they weren't even necessarily talking about Bitcoin. They I actually don't know if they even said anything about Bitcoin. They they were just saying that their own payment methods, their own payment systems and reward systems could be compromised by a bit license. So these this isn't this isn't some Bitcoin startup, some exchange. This is these are two really huge companies with legal departments that I'm sure are very highly funded at yeah, saying this. Very skilled. So it just goes to show how vague the bit license is. And I really hope Lasky and his successor take those comments to heart and really just rein it in. I wish they would just get rid of it altogether, but that's not going to happen. So I just really hope that they specify more. So if they kill if they kill Bitcoin, I guess that happens, but they don't have to they don't have to kill uh Walmart's and Amazon's gift cards and point systems in the process. That yeah. would just be bad for everybody. Yeah, they're so, taking a shotgun to the entire online digital economy, whether it's virtual currencies or even more established businesses that have been operating for years and years. And it's like your your wording is just just too vague. It's too right. vague. They're they're threatening everyone. That you they can't deny that anymore because to come to Bitcoin at all, Amazon has just flat out refused to even consider accepting Bitcoin. Uh, they may have changed their stance on that uh, since they said that over the summer, but they're even saying that this Bitcoin regulation is bad because it, it might harm their reward system or whatever they use that might be considered as a virtual currency. Yeah. Imagine um, uh, Amazon having to apply for the bit license <laughs> in order to keep yeah. operating their gift card and system. They have to hire a security team and, and yeah. all that, all that stuff. Dedicated uh, submit, just for that, just for the gift submit cards. Submit their fingerprints. Yeah. For their gift cards, um, criminal background checks, all that stuff. But yeah. another, <laughs> another kind of a, a pretty funny comment that people found was Professor Mark Williams, I think is his real name, but in the Bitcoin community, he's known as Professor Bitcoin, submitted his, submitted a comment to comment in basically he was just trolling the entire community because what he did was he just photocopied the proposal and he just wrote in the margins and like he scratched out words and stuff and changed the wording and added things. Yeah. Uh, he literally printed out the entire bit license 
and took a pen and wrote his own additions to it, adding in phrasing that he thinks would make it better. Um, very rarely he's actually crossing something out. He's just adding adding his own perspective to it. There's this already monstrous, like, far-reaching regulations. And then copies it again, photocopies it, scans it, and then uploads it as a as a comment to the to the Department of Financial Services. You know, I actually um, offered back in the summer, I think like in June, I actually offered to make a bet with him. And I, I wish he would have accepted it because I would have won. Yeah, I mean, this guy is not a betting man, obviously, because yeah. he made the claim about a year ago, I think it was, he said that the Bitcoin price would fall all the way to $10 by the summer of 2014. Based on what analysis, I I don't remember. I don't even know if there was any actual hard analysis <laughs> that led to that. But people, like, people lended this guy an extra amount of credibility just because he's a professor at a yeah, university. They called him an expert. <laughs> Yeah, economics expert, whatever, uh, at at Massachusetts University, a Massachusetts University, and he's, well, he got proven wrong, and apparently, he got proven wrong over the summer. Bitcoin did not fall to ten dollars; it stayed around four hundred range, four hundred, five hundred range, still in the four hundred range, and apparently, he's still following it. He's still following the community. He's still following the developments of regulation, and he's passionate enough about the topic to print out the regulations and write his own comments on it and submit it to the to the regulators. Like what does this guy do in his free time? <laughs> it's just it's really funny because he has every time he's in the media he's just talking about how bitcoin is just a terrible idea, it's going to fail, it's going to fall to $10 by first half of 2014. But just in case it doesn't let me give you my input on how we need to control it so it right. doesn't so it doesn't threaten the uh financial system too much yeah so i mean give him give him maybe another year and i think we we might have a dedicated bitcoiner on our hands <laughs> if we just give maybe. him some time and give him some time to warm up to it because okay predicting that it was going to fall to 10 dollars that wasn't based on any real analysis or anything it was pretty much just based on his own his own greed, his own jealousy, his own feeling that he had missed the boat on making a lot of money off this brand new asset that came out. And he's like, okay, you guys are all buying at the top of the bubble. And that's actually going to fall to $10. And that's what I'm going to buy. And I'm going to get a ton of Bitcoins because I fucking love Bitcoins. But I only love them if they're $10. And that's when I want to buy a thousand of them or whatever. But I mean... This guy is clearly not a market analyst or any anything of that sort. Yeah. I'm not sure if he's even an economist. I think he might actually be a finance professor. Oh, yeah, I think you're right. Which would which is actually really important because there's a huge difference between finance and economics. Um mm -hmm. Of course, um, a financial expert does analyze the markets, and they're often really successful investors. But those are the Wall Street types. Yeah, if he if he doesn't, but if you're not, if you don't really know much about economics, I'm he's I'm sure he's taken economics classes since he's a finance professor. Mm. But if if your main study is in economics and you don't really understand how money works or really what it is. And you don't under, like you don't really have a really good understanding of like how a market operates. So you can't really sit there and say, "Well, I'm an expert on Bitcoin, so uh, then this is what's going to happen." Well, not, you don't really know what money is, so you can't be an expert on Bitcoin. So how are you going to tell anyone what happens? And people try to do this all the time, not just with Bitcoin, but with anything. Mm. Uh, even even economists who do think they have this great understanding of markets, but in the past five years has really put a huge dent in their credibility because all of their suggested policies 
everything that's been implemented as a result of their recommendations led to the financial crash of 2008. Yeah. So the, these people who aren't involved in Bitcoin and they just trash any kind of alternative approach to economics or don't aren't even involved in economics at all, but are really, you know, they teach finance classes at some university in Boston. Um, yeah, you can't you can't take these people seriously. They're they're of course they're going to be wrong because they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. They sit up in their ivory tower looking down on the on the rest of us plebeians thinking that they know better. They know what's going on. They're in on the truth of the matter and they think they know what's what's actually going on in these markets more than anyone else who actually participates in these markets who actually uh analyzes this stuff on a regular basis. I'm not saying that I'm one of those people. I'm just reporting some of the news on a podcast. But he claims to know a lot more than actual market analysis of of Bitcoin, and he just can't. He honestly, he could probably go on the Bitcoin market subreddit and learn a few things from them. More than no, he you knows. can't learn anything from them. They're just as dumb as. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry if there's anybody from Bitcoin markets watching, but all that technical analysis stuff it just doesn't work maybe it works in maybe it works in forex where the market is a little bit bigger and the data is a little more consistent but in bitcoin although they did they did kind of predict that jump from about two weeks ago when the no, whole they, the whole this is gentleman thing it. happened they didn't predict some it kind of macd little... uh trend line crossed over or something that's, that's not a, pre- a description of what's happening when I don't know exactly how it works, but when it when it crosses over some threshold, it, it, it's not saying that this is what's going to happen in the future. It's like it's already happened. That's it's it's just it's just analyzing past data, and they try to speculate speculate on future data with yeah. it. Now, and these these technical analysis tools come from uh, the foreign exchange markets. People use those same tools to analyze uh, foreign currencies and try to predict their values and profit off of it by trading currencies. And I don't have any experience in Forex, so I don't, maybe that stuff is really useful, but also those markets are a lot larger. The data is a lot more consistent because the markets can't be influenced by individuals as easily. Bitcoin, you really can't use that same data because it just fluctuates so rapidly so really Mm -hmm. all you can do at this point is just do a really basic fundamental analysis saying look all things being equal this is what's going to happen because every single technical analysis i've seen they're like based on this past data all these all these technical indicators suggest that we're going to go through the roof or we're going to go crash into the floor go underground the price is going to go so low but then it just market sentiments and valuations just change so fast because the market is so small and it's so easily influenced by individuals that the that data just doesn't hold up because it's just so prone to change and that's just something that comes with an extremely volatile currency like a bitcoin you want to do it with the dollar and the yen and the euro that yeah that might work because they're a lot more stable so the data like i have already said several times is it's a lot more consistent on those larger markets but you just can't i don't know if you'll ever be able to use maybe you will be able to someday once the market is large enough but it's just it's trash. It's, That's it's, all it is right now. <laughs> it yeah, never it's, works. It's hard. It's hard because it, it, it's a really small market and there's big fish out there. There's whales out there who have a lot of capital and they're good at what they do. There's a lot of people who come from a Wall Street background who are trading on Bitcoin exchanges and they're just bringing all these small time traders for, along for the ride and they, they run the show. I mean, the... the most high profile example of this is probably the bear whale that happened a month or two ago um, when this guy started selling like 30,000 bitcoins and crashed the price down to $300 and just kept it at 300 for a really long time until he was like, okay, I'll take my hands yeah. off this now. We're good. 
This can go back even, up now. Even more recently, just three weeks ago, uh, when the price spiked up to 500 again, or maybe I think it was actually might have went to 550. I can't remember, but I saw a, some technical analysis guy using his fancy charts and moving averages and all this stuff, Fibonacci sequences, and he was like, "the the price is gonna go." Oh, it went up to 450. It was in the 300s, and it went up to 450. Mm-hmm. It's like this rally is gonna continue. It's gonna go up, and it's gonna bust the 500 threshold. And it's just going to keep going. Who knows where it's going to stop? Well, what happened in reality was that that sharp jump in the price happened, occurred because of one person put in a huge order on one of the markets. I can't remember. And he didn't he didn't buy any more. So mm. all that upward momentum just went away because that one guy stopped buying. Mm. And his entire analysis fell apart because... Uh, was based on an assumption that the price increase was caused by millions of people making small contributions to this giant market. But really, it was just one guy who was, you know, richer than most people on the Bitcoin market. Mm. So the only thing that mattered was his individual uh, valuation in that particular instance. So that 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 one um, analyst prediction just completely fell apart because he was looking at the wrong data yeah well going back to mr uh, bitcoin you can be damn sure that guy isn't looking at these markets or any of these trends he's not looking at any data <laughs> yeah he's just like this bitcoin thing uh ten dollars that's what it sounds like <laughs> yeah ten dollars by uh summer yeah that's what i think yeah good luck with that um uh one other thing that I want, wanted to mention about the bit license comments that were released was actually Western Union, the remittance company that charges an arm and a leg just to transfer money uh, across borders, actually submitted a comment to the bit license. And they had a different criticism of it than Amazon and Walmart did. They actually had a problem with how the Bitcoin ATMs would be regulated. They thought that there would be there should be more oversight over the ATM kiosks what locations they would be allowed to be in and like whether or not the ATMs would uh classify as a money transmitter or whether those transactions would uh would classify as virtual currency transmissions and like this is it's kind of a random criticism to have because the ATMs are already like really AML KYC compliant. They have to collect uh, buyers and sellers information, I believe, uh, who they are, identification documents, all that. And apparently Western Union sees that the bit license doesn't go far enough in solidifying those types of requirements. So do, do you think that this is like a an example of Western Union kind of trying to hold these these ATMs back and sees it as a threat to their remittance, their remittance business. I was surprised, really, because Bitcoin ATMs aren't really a big thing in the Bitcoin economy. They're they're scarce. There's not a lot of them, mm. and they're a lot of them are kind of difficult to use. Uh, the RoboCoin ones have all this crazy like biometric security measures that takes more personal information than a bank account does. Um, So I have never really considered their potentials are unlimited, but how they are right now, I've never considered thing. And the exchange rate itself is, is considerably higher than you would even find on Coinbase or Circle. I saw this one person on Reddit posted a picture of an ATM he came across and the buy the buying price was like five or six hundred dollars or something like that, and the exchange rate, or the the price on an exchange rather, is around like four seventy. Yeah. So, and I think that's part so, of that's because the ATM operators, when they buy the ATM, they can choose how much of a premium they put 
on the on the exchange rate. Right. So undoubtedly, a lot of those people are like, hey, I want to get as much profit as possible. I got these customers coming in, and they're curious about Bitcoin, and they don't really know of any other easy ways to get it. They just see these this ATM here. I'll charge them 20% markup rate on the exchange rate. You know, if anything is going to get regulated, that sh the you know the markup rate should be regulated, not the location of the ATMs. Well, um, I don't know about price fixing. That's a that's another debate to be had. But I was just all these deficiencies with Bitcoin ATMs. Really, it because of those deficiencies, it really surprised me that Western Union felt was felt threatened enough by the ATMs that they. So that they had to submit a comment to Ben Lasky saying, suggesting that every uh, Bitcoin ATM location be approved. Like every time somebody wants to install a Bitcoin ATM, it has to be improved by the New York Department of Financial Services. So I don't maybe maybe ATMs are more prevalent than I thought they were. If Western Union feels threatened by them. But I don't know. I just never, I never paid that much attention to them. So it was really surprising to me. Yeah, they, they, they definitely see it as some sort of adversarial threat. And we talked last week about their copyright takedown request of the ad that people were posting on social media that compared the Western Union. Um, exchange fee to Bitcoin's almost zero exchange fee. Western uh, Onion. Yeah, the Western Onion and send warm Satoshis and all that business. So uh, they're, they've got an eye on it and they're like, oh, this thing has the potential to to really be big in, in remittance. And hey, they're trying to protect their turf basically. So best of luck to your dying business. But you know, I, another thing that I just thought of, I, I wonder why Western Union feels threatened enough by Bitcoin ATMs to try to get them restricted in New York. In my opinion, threat that Bitcoin poses to Western Union and the remittance market, that's that's way more of a threat than a Bitcoin ATM is. I. I th would think Western Union would be trying to get governments of developing countries whose citizens rely on remitten remittances to try to ban Bitcoin or something rather than mm. get this highly industrialized financial economy in New York City to ban some insignificant portion of the Bitcoin economy. Yeah, and that's that's a good point because... If ATMs really, because we, we, we've got, well, like dozens of ATMs, almost 100, almost at this point, I think, around the world. And most of those, I think, are in the United States and Europe. But if you ever see these things start to take off in places like Africa or South America, where there's developing economies uh, that want to bypass the old, outdated banking system, uh like then you would probably start to see Western Union really take out the boxing gloves and, and really start taking shots at this thing and uh, launching possibly even bigger attacks uh, against Bitcoin remittance possibilities and really try and say, okay, no, Bitcoin ATMs are outright banned in these countries. We're not going to let that happen. Uh, you know, that's what I would imagine would possibly be the the their reaction in those in those uh, other countries because if that happens then then then, then they're screwed yeah i guess they just don't really understand what exactly they're fighting against hmm. they just don't have their priorities straight which is a good thing because that's less resistance bitcoin's going to have yeah. on an international level but it's they're just happen eventually in terms of their own well-being they're just they're not really sure where to start with Bitcoin, it seems like. So uh, let's let's talk about something else that happened in the past week. Um, the second Silk Road auction happened for the stash of Ross Ulbricht's Bitcoins. The guy who allegedly ran Silk Road was the kingpin. And this week, uh, the U.S. Marshals Service sold... 50,000 bitcoins uh, in an auction 
uh, and we don't know who won the majority of those yet, and we might never know because they're not obligated to disclose that. But Tim Draper, the investor who won the original 30000 earlier this year in June, he announced that he won only 2,000 Bitcoins this time, worth roughly $750,000. Uh, and I guess that's, that's, all, that's all he won this time. I guess he didn't bid high enough or, or what. But um, the, the Bitcoins are sold. Um, I assume at this point that they have been transferred to the new owner. If I had to make an educated guess about who won it, um, I would think it would be the Bitcoin Investment Trust run by Barry Silbert, who also does Second Market. Um, he set up a syndicate, this time like last time, but this time he actually had more participants in his syndicate. Um where people basically send him the bids and then his organization bids for the bitcoins on their behalf. And apparently he got more investors this time than the other time. And I would think that he won a pretty good chunk of them, but we don't know for sure. And we're waiting for, you know, some kind of announcement about who won those bitcoins. So. We follow the auction because I was like, I, I went along with apparently everyone else in the Bitcoin community and just didn't find it that interesting. Uh, so, well, even in the first auction, the only thing I was really interested in was uh, the effect that was having on the price. And I, I followed that and did wrote several articles on it, uh, speculating on what the auction would be due to the price so what i was looking for this time was of course uh it's price action but nothing happened and uh i that's really the only it's really the only interesting thing that i got from it i i don't know maybe it's interesting to everybody else but it's just tim draper won some coins just like last time and we don't know who else won them and that's that's pretty much all there is to say about it. Mm -hmm. So what I, the only thing I've been thinking about in terms of the auction is the Bitcoin price and, you know, um, it's been pretty I, stable. I can, I can give you my thoughts, but we've already spent some, a considerable amount of time on the price this episode. So I don't know if you want me to talk about it anymore. Yeah. I mean, we can, we can do a little bit more current price analysis because we, we've talked about, um, what, how the price behaved earlier this year, but like, I mean, the price itself for the past couple of weeks has been relatively boring. Um, it's really just been hovering in the 375 range. And if you actually, if you go to uh, bitcoinity.org and look at the 30 day chart for Bitstamp, um, it almost flatlines starting around November 28th. And then, you know, for the for the next almost two weeks, it flatlines around 375. So this thing is, it's almost, it feels like the calm before the storm, almost. Uh, oh, you think something huge is going to happen? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, I don't know if it's going to be tomorrow or next week, but something, something is, is, is building up. And really, like, the, the volume gets really tiny as well just in the past couple days. So... Uh, I don't know if it's going to have a breakout moment and, and climb up, you know, by $50 or so, or if it's going to have a breakout moment and slip down $50 or so. Uh, I'm not a professional al analyst enough to try and uh, make any concrete assertions, but it, it's, it seems eerily calm. I'll, I'll say that for sure. It's definitely... It feels strange around 375, and remember last year, or I mean earlier this year, after the first auction happened, there was the climb up in price um, by about $100, $150 or so. And... Well, that was after Tim Draper announced that he won all of them. Mm -hmm. um, and that was also back when news was still affecting the Bitcoin price. Mm. The reason why I think this auction hasn't really done anything to the bitcoin price is that the market is just so much different uh one i i think 
in the the first half of 2014 when news was still significantly affecting the bitcoin price it we were just starting to come out of the stage where uh bitcoin's legitimacy had to be proved to everyone Mm -hmm. and uh so every time any kind of news story came out that hurt or helped bitcoin's legitimacy or how people viewed it or whatever then people would buy and sell based on that but i think we've we've convinced enough people and we've got a, like a large enough user base that uh, there's just this, this block of people who are going to be involved in the media says about it. So it's just news isn't, is nowhere near as powerful as it used to be. And this first auction went, it, it occurred with in that, in that, stage those late stages where news still mattered a whole bunch Mm. and also um merchant adoption is a lot huger so there's a lot of there's a lot of merchants uh dumping coins to pay their costs in dollars we've talked about this at length uh which provides just like a constant source of downward pressure uh which seems to have And demand seems to have, you know, kind of leveled out and lined up with that supply because the price has been like, like you said, eerily flat the past uh, couple days. Yeah. And let me let me add something on to the merchant adoption point is something that I kind of realized in the past week or so is that, uh, you know, I'm not a big trader or anything, but apparently these exchanges, there's APIs that you can use to sell coins automatically at a certain time interval interval or at a certain price interval and uh you can you can just tell the exchange you can just set some options to basically sell literally the moment it changes from like 375 to 376 and then sell like one bitcoin at that at that point and yeah. you, you just set that option and you don't have to pay any attention to it at all and it just does it for you so uh, you know, maybe, maybe that's why we don't see as much volatility is you have people who just sell, um, even at a $1 increase in price. Cause they know they have to sell and they're like, okay, if I'm going to recoup, um, if I'm going to recoup, uh, a significant amount of my costs then I might as well do it. Uh, even when there's just a dollar increase in price, cause that's all I'm going to get, uh, in this really, um, stable like flatline market right now so uh you've got people doing that and you aren't going to see a lot of volatility until some kind of x factor jumps in and really changes the equation in a significant way right and i think well i mean going from that i i think a lot of people may just just be not trading as much because the year's coming to a close and it's the holiday season. We just had Thanksgiving in the U S and, you know, Christmas is coming up soon. People are spending more time with their families and, you know, work is starting to wind down, things like that. Um, something I just thought of Bitcoin's user base is relatively young and it's finals week <laughs> all across the nation mm. suffering through that right now. So it it could just be that people don't really have the time or the desire to mess with Bitcoin right now. But going going back to the auction, the market is a lot different today than it was back in May or June, whenever it was, when the auction was. Um, so at first I thought it was kind of odd that it didn't have much of an effect. But then after I thought about it, I wasn't really surprised because really no news has had any effect on the price recently. It's just been, um, it's just been whales really have been the major, the major movers of the market. Um, everything else since July has just been, uh, going downward. And I, I think, uh, that's also something else I was meaning to say. Another thing of, of a multitude of things that are contributing to this have left the market in the last uh, six months uh, because they they bought in back at Mount Gox and price just kept going down. Hmm. So now they're out. And uh, yeah, safe to say yeah. that those 
people are mostly out of Bitcoin by now. Yeah, so I mean, it's just I, the market ha is really is really changing, and we're we're gonna have to figure out what if affects the price most now it's not news anymore um really the up and down movements of the day-to-day -day activity it just seems like normal trading activity that you're not going to be able to decipher unless you just ask people like why are you buying or why are you selling mm -hmm. and that's not really you know it's, there's no use to do that that's not going to give you any significant information yeah. but we're just going to have to sit it out i think i'm i'm waiting on some some of the Black Friday merchants may be dumping. They might just be selling it little bits at a time for like almost no profit, just like one dollar. And uh, I think it it might be like this through Christmas. I don't know. It might not start moving significantly again until 2015 starts up. Yeah, um, I mean, any anything can happen. Um... Uh, speaking of the the price drop and and price uh, you know stagnation basically, uh, it has kind of influenced the difficulty of mining to actually drop for the first time in two years. Uh, the difficulty dropped by 0.62%, which is less than 1%, not much, but it's significant because the difficulty has been steadily rising and rising and rising for the past two years. And, uh, you know, for the first time, uh, people are, people who are mining on the network are kind of maybe pulling back a bit and maybe not investing as much in miners or maybe even selling off their mining hardware while they can still recoup some costs because they don't feel like uh, they can mine at a profit at the current Bitcoin price. Um, whatever they paid for that particular mining hardware, they're not, they, they have less faith that they're going to see a return um, on their investment. So you see a, a slight minor drop in the difficulty of, of mining on the, on the network. Well, I don't know if you remember this or not, but a few months ago, back uh, in August, maybe, uh, late July, early August, I I said this was going to happen. The price was falling, and I, I was like, well, I mean, best one good thing that could come from this is mining difficulty will go down. Some of the big players might pull back a little bit and we'll get a break from centralization. So yeah, uh, that's not, I don't really have anything insightful to say about that. I just wanted to point out that I was right about something. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Pat on the back. But, um, yeah, I, it was kind of a surprise to me. Well, I don't really follow mining. So anything that, is any mining development is a surprise to me, but when I saw mining difficulty uh, decreased, I was I was like, wow, that means you know the big guys are a little less profitable now, and you know maybe centralization will cool down a little bit until the price goes back up, which yeah. back a few months ago I said would would be a good thing because it would give us time to a little more time to think about how we could stop it. Yeah. Uh, everybody's already forgotten about mining centralization. Nobody cares about it anymore. So Although they should. Yeah. It's still it's still an issue. And uh, I'm going to play a little bit of devil's advocate here and say that this is actually um, possibly a sign of more centralization and, and just an, another step on the long process towards centralization because people pulling away from the network, shutting their miners down, um, it's hard to know whether those people are the big mining farms who are part of the centralization trend or if they're small-time miners who just bought a $1,000 or $2,000 rig and find that they are only going to make 500 or $600 off that based on the current price and, and they're pulling off the network. Um, and if that's the case, then this is definitely making centralization worse. Because um, 
yeah, I, I mean, the, the the goal is to have a distributed decentralized network, and it's not as decentralized and distributed when you've got small, you know, regular people uh, having a mining rig in, in their home, um, just as a side income sort of thing, who basically don't want to do it anymore because it's not profitable. And the only, uh, the only places that remain profitable are the large mining farms who have invested, you know, like a, like a million dollars into mining hardware and have all this in a gigantic warehouse in, in the middle of China or, you know, a, a lot of them are moving into cooler places in Europe as well because it, um, they have to spend less on cooling facilities for those large operations. And I think that those types of operations are actually the le- the least likely to shut down as the result of a price decrease because it's just impractical to shut one of those down just because of a temporary price decrease. Uh, it's a lot harder to shut that down and sell all of those units on the market or whatever and repurpose that warehouse for something else that you think that will be more profitable for you. So, I mean, my my cynical fear is that it's actually the small-time miners who are who are shutting down, leading to more centralization. Well, uh, firstly, I don't know if less than 1% is really going to push any significant amount of people away. I don't, uh, I don't know. Like I said, I don't follow, really follow mining at all. So I don't know. I don't know how big 0.62% is in terms of decreasing uh, profitability or whatever. But also I don't know, like maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just misunderstanding this, but the way I see it, when when the price goes down and mining becomes less profitable and the difficulty goes down, it see to me, it seems like the the smaller guys it would be easier for them to mine, and and yeah. the bigger and the bigger guys there it's easier for them to mine too, obviously because the price is going down, but they're they're also making significantly less profits, but their costs are still being held constant because of um, electricity and things. Because it's not like, it's not like they're going to mine less. They're, it's, you know, it's not like if the price goes down and the difficulty drops, they're, they're going to mine less because they mine the same amount. Mm -hmm. And, and so their costs will be held constant, but their revenue is decreased. Uh, yeah. Meanwhile, you have the smaller guy who's using much less resources, and it's um, now it's a lot easier for him to mine. But I don't know. Maybe I'm just misunderstanding it. But like I said, I, um, if less than one percent is really as insignificant as it seems, I don't think it's going to have a really huge impact either way on small or large miners. Yeah, yeah. Don't get me wrong. This isn't a a big issue or anything and and it won't be until or unless the the percentage actually increases a lot and becomes a a serious thing that people need to face but um you know i'm just i'm just voicing my you know alarmist attitude towards centralization as i have in the past uh but yeah well, less than 1% it's not really a big deal and there's been tons of people who have been predicting predicting this for a long time not just you, um, CoinDesk actually did a pretty long feature article like three months ago where they predicted this was going to happen. Stagnation in price would lead to lower difficulty. Um, so it's not like this is really surprising at all. If anything, it's actually surprising how long it took for this decrease to happen. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's not, it's not that surprising. Uh, I saw this one guy on Reddit... Um... He had some kind of background in physics. I can't remember exactly what he said, what his credentials were, but he he used physics to explain why mining centralization wasn't a big deal, and it had it had something to do with uh, with heat. And uh, you know, as the as the mining rigs become so advanced and use up so much energy, um, 
it would just be so it produced so much heat that even like mining in Iceland uh, with a huge rig wouldn't be as profitable as just running a smaller machine that that requires less resources to cool down. I mm. I, I just kind of skimmed through his post because it was a huge wall of text, but he's he's basically saying it's just gonna get it. Bitcoin mining just produces too much heat for miners to to be centralized, and they'll and they'll eventually. Uh, and they'll eventually uh, just go back to being small time again. Mm-hmm. And also, he said he said that um, the heat that miners produce it's it's um, it's hot enough to heat up water and not much else. So he he had this uh, this like vision of of large selling their like selling their energy to uh like water companies so they could like heat water and and uh houses and they could sell their heat interesting idea that, for sure yeah that was interesting but i don't i'm i'm honestly not as gloom and doom as you are about mining centralization i don't i don't think i think it could be i think it's a problem but um i i just don't think it's going to be like the end of bitcoin um mostly because an article i read it was i already knew it but it just kind of reminded me that most of the hashing power is in is in pools which are controlled by collections of individuals so really even when a pool gets 51 percent, there's like the risk isn't that one person owns 51 percent and they can do an attack on off chance that somebody gets control of the pool and they somehow force everyone to uh, commit a 51% attack, but it's just I, the incentives, the economic incentives just don't line up for executing a 51% attack from a mining pool. Mm-hmm. And that's where most of the power is. I just, I just don't see it being a big threat. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm not going to argue with you on that point. Uh it's I don't think it's a big threat. There's a lot of experts who don't think it's a big threat. I'm just saying that a couple years ago that this was a lot more of a decentralized and distributed network. Um any old regular person could um join in the network and participate and, and earn some extra income with their home computer or with their modded computer, with their gaming computer, just something that they already had that they could just um, devote a little bit of extra computing, computing time to and actually earn a little bit of extra income and participate in securing the network. And that's just not the case anymore. So now we kind of have to kind of have to trust that the system will also work regardless when it's just the large time operators who are, who are doing this stuff. And, you know, it, it's a very interesting economic system that has been invented alongside Bitcoin and it seems to be working out so far and um, hopefully that it will, it will continue to work out for years to come and that uh, these people who control these mining pools, these people who control these large mining farms will continue to uh, have a stake in the network and will not be willing to launch an attack on it because if they do, if they do t- try to launch a 51% attack, um, they risk dwindling their own value of their own coins down to zero. So that's the risk that they take. That's the economic incentive that they would be moving against if they chose to attack it. So yeah, right. I I think the the biggest threat it's not going to be from people inside the Bitcoin community. It's going to be from people who have an axe to grind with bitcoin as a technology they just hate it for whatever reason uh because i well i recently learned about a new kind of mining attack it's called block withholding and uh it doesn't i it's kind of a little too technical for me because i'm you know far from an expert on bitcoin mining but basically it from what i could understand is that it's really not very profitable for um, for anybody. What happens is you just um, you just don't broadcast a block you mined and 
keeps the pool from making money and it i think it like keeps the difficulty from increasing or something but it's like there's there's a way to do it um i mean again i'm far from like having a complete understanding on this but it's basically um people can like infiltrate a mining pool and just shut it down by withholding blocks basically uh, I, th- I think is is what it is and that would that is um sounds to me like a much easier way to hurt the bitcoin uh ecosystem than gaining 51 percent of all the hashing power and then double spending it and ruining uh possibly ruining everyone's confidence in it so yeah I, and and in that case like people of andreas antonopoulos have countered that if that were to happen everyone would realize that it's happening practically instantly and it would just hold up the network for an hour two hours whatever it takes for people to fix it and then um people would just move on with their lives after that and just just start up the blockchain again and just ignore uh, the tra- the illegitimate transactions that the at- attacker tried to tried to execute so uh, 51% attack um, def- yeah not a, not a big issue not yet yeah it i mean it it could be though if some insidious character got a hold of this a huge amount of hashing power but i I just I have always wondered if if it's possible to come up with a way to like if there's some kind of protocol change that can be implemented to like place a limit on the amount of hashing power any one miner can have. Like I don't know if I'm I know literally nothing about computer science so and, and nothing about the inner workings of the Bitcoin protocol. So that's just some wild idea i had but i don't if i don't know if that would be possible or not yeah it seems like there has to be some way like bitcoin is just so uh versatile and flexible that there's got to be some way to put like a hard stop on mining centralization i th- i think if it ever becomes a really huge threat i think people will like will start researching that more um, yeah, even if they decide to kind of kick the can down the road, so to speak, and not face this issue until it actually becomes like a tangible problem, um, it seems pretty reasonable to think that they'll be able to fix it fairly quickly if a problem does arise. At least they're not like, at least the Bitcoin core developers aren't like the U.S. Congress who will kick the can down the road until there's no road left to kick the can down. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I definitely, I have full faith in these, in these computer geniuses because, hey, they created the, you know, first full-blown economic system, um, the world has ever seen that exists solely on the internet, that is, creates a currency that, uh, can't be manipulated, uh, you know, it's, it's, no matter how bad mining centralization gets, it'll never be as bad as the centralized Federal Reserve, Mm-hmm. who print billions upon billions of dollars month by month and give it away to the banks for 0% interest rates. So, hey, <laughs> it won't be as bad as that messed up system. So that's that's the silver lining. But hey, we, we added 321,000 jobs this month, which is the first time, or the last four months have only been 200,000. So... And the incomes at point four percent, I think. So it's it's getting All better. Right. Yay, yay for um, more part time jobs in a populace that is deprived. No, it's des- it's it's actually full time jobs. Okay, well, okay, well yeah. then, that's that's but, surprisingly uh, optimistic, in my book. Not really. It's to me, it's just a sign that the next bubble is getting pumped up. All like, right. I mean, the the metrics can improve all they all you want but um at the end of the day just the the sole fact that it's it's happening because of fractional reserve banking paired with money creation from the fed direct injections into the bank it's just creating some it's just creating structural uh dilutions in in the 
in production it, it's just it's that pumps up a, a starts up a business cycle and starts projects that are just totally unprofitable so mm-hmm. the i mean the numbers are good but the underlying structure of the economy which is the capital structure it's just all kinds of messed up because of fractional reserve banking uh messing with the interest rates so yeah it's a it's a beautiful sham isn't it um let's let's mention the bitcoin foundation we talked about uh, last week how the foundation um actually decided that they're going to focus more on core development of the bitcoin protocol and less on lobbying governments for favorable legislation and they actually uh hired um a new developer for a security role he'll do core security um auditing of the bitcoin protocol and he's been hired by the foundation he's you know he's not going to be talking with politicians and lobbyists in order to get regulation instead he'll actually be doing something useful uh which is actually working on the code uh looking for possibly security vulner- vulnerabilities in the code you know hopefully maybe even mining centralization and that and that block that block blocking attack that you mentioned earlier and kind of look to improve the code uh, and get paid to do that on a yearly basis. So that's that's good news, right? Yeah, it seems like the foundation is kind of is staying true to what they said they were going to do. So they're increasing the budget and hiring more people. That's always for development, not for politics. That's always great because politics are lame. Yeah, and there's just no place for it in Bitcoin. Yeah, not particularly useful. Not at not not at this point in in Bitcoin's um, development. Literally, like it's it's development. So let's develop the actual code and let's not develop the politics surrounding it. Yeah, we don't we don't even know what Bitcoin is gonna be. Uh, we don't we don't know what it's gonna be next year, much less five years from now. So it's it's, it's just really kind of absurd that we have places governments like new york trying to pass definitive concrete uh regulation as if this is the end stage of bitcoin mm. like 10 years from now if bitcoin's still around the businesses surrounding it just may be totally unrelated to the the bit license regulation and then yeah. not only did the those uh former Bitcoin companies waste their time being compliant with all of it, but NY, but the NYDFS will have wasted so much money and resources. Yeah, pouring over it, all those comments and everything. Right, it was... and So there's just no sense in it right now because we have no idea where it's going, so what's even the point? So good for the Bitcoin Foundation for sticking to their promise and hiring a new guy hopefully they'll hire more yeah yeah and i I, you know i want to add on to that point that you just made as well um like one thing that might totally change in, in just a year is okay in a year from now bitcoin might actually be a stock exchange if if counterparty and their medici project and what patrick byrne is trying to do with overstock and the whole you know, digital currency stock stock exchange platform. If that comes to fruition, I mean, how's the bit license going to deal with that? That's going to be a brand new thing that they didn't see coming. And it's like, oh yeah, we just we just got the bit license finalized. People are going to have to get the bit license if they want to become Bitcoin exchanges or ATMs or whatever it is. But oh, all of a sudden, there's now a stock exchange that uses the same technology. And that's not regulated based on the current framework. Back to the drawing board. Oh, great, you know. So yeah, it's it's completely pointless to try and regulate it right now because it's still changing every single year. New additions coming onto the platform, onto the ecosystem, and um, yeah, it's it's yeah. Thank God they're focusing more on development than than politics. That's actually an interesting thought, though. With the the uh, Bitcoin stock exchange that uh, Patrick Byrne is working on like do you think the SEC will get involved in that 
yeah, I mean, I, I think they will somehow. Uh, the counterparty guys actually signaled before that they are looking forward to working with reg regulators and they expect to work with regulators. So, you know, they're inviting the conversation, basically. They're not opposed to it. Overstock is a, is a large established corporation that follows the laws. They're, they're into the legal stuff. So, you know, of, of course they're, they're inviting regulation. They're inviting that conversation to happen. I just don't know what type of form the SEC will try and impose on it. Uh, like this is really uncharted territory. We have no idea how they're going to react to this. If they might try and shut it down, who knows? Who knows? Yeah, it'll definitely be interesting to see in the future. Mm -hmm. Hope I mean, hopefully there will be Bitcoin companies large enough to to participate on a stock ex stocks and it be, you know, worthwhile. Mm. Not these not these like altcoin IPOs which yeah, no. end up being scams. No. Like I, I would I think it'd be cool to see you know, maybe maybe Coinbase might do an IPO on a, a counterparty exchange or counterpart counterparty stock market. Mm -hmm. That would be pretty cool. Yeah, and like once if Overstock nails this and does this right, uh, they will prove to other businesses, other investors, other entrepreneurs that this is really possible to do, and. Overstock will just pave the way and you'll start seeing other large businesses kind of jump on board and be like, wait, I can issue shares directly to investors in my company without going through a middleman, without even going through Wall Street, without having to go through E-Trade or Goldman Sachs or, or any of these people and no brokers or anything. All they need to do is download a program on the computer and make a few clicks and send some Bitcoin and all of a sudden they... They own part of my company, huh? No, oh, that's um, yeah. I'll try that, and then I mean, forget about all these small-time scams and and stuff like that in the cryptocurrency s scene. You'll start seeing actual legitimate established businesses jump on board with this and kind of see how profitable and how useful this is for them and their customers and their shareholders as well. It's there's a lot of stuff going on in the Bitcoin world these days. It's, it's going to be an interesting future ahead of us. Yeah, very interesting. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, one last thing I want to mention before we start to close this up is Change Tip, uh, the tipping service that has gone viral on social media, Reddit, YouTube, and Twitter, and other sites as well. They actually announced last week that they have raised 3.5 million dollars in seed funding uh, from a group of investors led by Pantera Capital. So I think this is significant because uh, first of all this this went viral a lot of people started tipping you had 10,000 user tips in one day $40,000 worth of tips exchanged um, in one day and Apparently, they're getting a lot of recognition, not just from the community, but also from investors as well. And Pantera Capital is a strong believer in them. They believe that Change Tip could actually pave the way to be the definitive micro tipping and micro payments service on the internet. And, you know, great, great for them, great for them. $3.5 million for them now to kind of boost development try and uh, work their way, way into other social networks. The big one that they haven't managed to break into yet is Facebook, although they kind of promise um, on their social networks list that Facebook is in the works. So $3.5 million is assumed to kind of uh, push that along faster. And who knows, maybe soon we'll start to see greater integration within those social networks. Maybe soon you'll be able to see... Uh, a tipping button integrated within Reddit or within the Reddit enhancement suite so that nobody uh, has to make a comment to make a tip, for example. It can just be a click or maybe two clicks if you want to make like double the default amount or something. 
Um, so it's great. It's great. We're going to see more progress right. in the tipping scene. I think it would be cool to see something like you said. Uh, I don't, I don't know what it's called, but when you when you're at a Reddit comment and you can you have you can click for permalink source and whatnot, and it has yeah. give gold. I would yeah. like to see like next to the give gold button, um, a Bitcoin tip button, a change tip button. Yep. So, do you think that's the kind of stuff that we'll see coming from this uh, from this VC funding? Things like improving the user interface, things like that. Yeah, I I think I think that it can lead to that, but it depends on how much cooperation they get from Reddit themselves. Because if you look at Reddit's plans that they have made earlier in this year, they have looked into their own ways of creating their own cryptocurrency, and they actually got a, a bunch of investment from some high-profile investors, including Snoop Dogg, I think and some other big people um that, so like reddit has has already been planning something like this they're planning to make a kind of decentralized coin for re rewarding comments and stuff like that now if change tip goes to them and, and is, is like we already have this system set up we have this infrastructure that people are already using within comments to to do this Will you let us uh, kind of integrate directly within the comment system with a little button, like you said, click to give Bitcoin or whatever? Um, will Reddit agree to that? Or will they kind of be like, no, um, we have already got our own thing planned for that. Just just hold on for a little while and we'll make something on our own that's even better than what you've got planned. But either way, something like this is, is coming, I'm telling you, because... Uh, Reddit's gold system is, is great and all, but um, it can definitely be made easier to use for like sending just small amounts. Um, I think gold is worth like three, five dollars. I don't know, maybe even twenty when you buy it at first is twenty bucks or something. But I think uh, it's uh, I think it's three bucks a month, and you can buy like they have several different options for like one month, three months, a year. Okay, yeah, I mean, like that that alone, that type of subscription service is already kind of outdated at this point. People, at this point, with the change tip system, people are already used to just getting an account and topping it up with however much Bitcoin they want to fund it with, whether it's 25 cents or $25, and just do that and be on their merry way and send that to someone via Reddit or YouTube or whatever, so... Um, change tip, change tip is a lot is is a is definitely better in some ways, and um, we'll just have to wait and see if Reddit kind of agrees to integrate that further within their system, or if they want to make their own thing. Um, and even if even if Reddit does make their own thing, change tip is already making inroads on YouTube, on Twitter, um, so they're making a lot of progress, and and they've. They've gotten a lot of success in this last half of 2013, or 2014, I mean. Uh, so, you know, best of luck to them. I, I, I hope they kind of use this money to make things even more streamlined and uh, kind of make t tipping go even more viral. Make it so that people want to buy Bitcoin uh, in, order to, in order to basically tip someone specifically on YouTube or whatever. Oh, I like that YouTube video. I want to send them 25 cents right now. How do I do that? Oh, there's this change tip service, but how do I get Bitcoin? I mean, I would be happy if they ended up getting even more funding if they, you know, did some additional VC rounds and got even more funding. I think they definitely I think I think they're on to something with tipping. It it's just it's really crazy how much it's grown over the last month. Uh, when it went viral a few weeks ago, I just there were so many people on Reddit. They're like, "I'm new to this. I just got I just got tipped. Is this real money? How does it work? How do I spend it?" So even if it even if tipping, I don't I don't really know if tipping will ever become like a big financial thing. Like people on youtube if they if they make videos if they could ever like make a living off of bitcoin tips like they do off of putting ads on their youtube videos but 
it's still a really great educational tool because and it exposes people to Bitcoin, which is where I my I personally think the real value in uh, tipping is, and so I I hope Change Tip uh, continues to focus on that that small scale tipping like really small amounts of things really small amounts of money for just like whatever reason because that mm. really seems to get people interested and it seems to bring people into the fold yeah yeah it's 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 really great um so we're we're just about reaching the end of the podcast here but uh one last thing that i want to kind of mention is that uh this game i've been playing uh kind of throughout the podcast and by playing i really mean just tapping <laughs> uh, it's called bitcoin billionaire it finally came out uh for android this week and um i i have a i have a mild addiction to it which is only getting worse as i get more and more bits imaginary bits in the game um evan you've been playing this as well haven't you i yeah <laughs> i got it about when did it it came out on about two days ago i think i got it mm -hmm. when um i saw that it came out on android i said reddit i meant to say it came out on android and i'm i'm addicted to it now i let's i actually i've been a good little podcaster and i haven't played since we started recording <laughs> so, so let's see how much i have I'm up in I'm up into the petabytes. I just got up into the petabytes. See, today. I've got to catch up to you so. over here. That's why I'm I'm trying to tap during the podcast is because uh, <laughs> you're so much richer than me in these fake bits. Um, <laughs> I'm at 1.7, and my offline investments are at 48.4 uh, terabytes. That's what I can earn offline. So, so yeah, it's... um, yeah, I'll I'll sum up the game for people who haven't played it yet. Um. Basically, you just your guy is just sitting at a computer on this screen. It's a it's just a static you know kind of environment where you're sitting at a computer and you tap, and your guy starts typing on the keyboard, and that's you know it's like mining bitcoins. That's what they call it. It's mining bitcoins. And as you get more and more, you can use that money to upgrade your living space. You can upgrade your bitcoin mining software. You can buy investments like lottery tickets, comic books, collectible toys, medicinal herb farms, <laughs> which we all know what that is, uh, invest in the video game industry, esports, and as you get really, really rich, which is where the point where Evan is approaching, um, you can start buying things like Stargate technology and time travel and Martian spa yep. and resort. I've, I've started investing in robot butlers, so that's... okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh yeah, it's it's really addicting, but I can't see it being much fun once I max it out. Like you can you can reset the game and start over at zero, but I I don't really see myself doing that. But that's how I am with all mobile games. I'll get really into it for like three days and then I'll quit. So mm -hmm. this one I'll I'll probably max out and be done with it. But it is definitely really entertaining especially is there's just all this zany stuff like all the these crazy investments and you have like amazon drones dropping packages and yeah robot vacuum cleaners <laughs> um yeah and honestly like i've been like it's i realized that this game is really well designed in kind of a weird like insidious way uh, you just you tap to get the bitcoins, and then when the Amazon drone flies in, you have to hold down on the box to open it. You can't just tap it and open it. So it's kind of like a a nice mix in finger action, I guess. Um, and then something you know random happens, and like you can either you can pick from three cards, and then either like your investment goes down or your investment goes up. Yeah, I always get the bad ones too. I'm the worst at picking those things. Oh, too bad. I, I usually get, um, see, look at this. I just got a herd of leprechauns passed by my window, <laughs> and um, my investment income is six times for three minutes. And yeah. this another th thing this game does really well is advertisements. Um, so, like, for instance, th I just got a good investment. I can double that by watching an ad or by paying two of the 
of the little bit hyper gems. Hyper bits. Hyper bits, yeah. Um, so I'm just going to watch an ad for 30 seconds and double that, that little bonus. Or I can choose not to and just accept the base bonus as it was. Um, it's a pretty, pretty cool implementation of ads. And other things like you can en enable banner ads if you choose to to enable you know double tapping investment so really well designed and um yeah you know whoever whoever made this pretty pretty good job there's a lot of nice jokes inside too for for kind of nerdy nerdy mindsets <laughs> uh but I've, on the more like conspiracy theory side of it i saw some people on reddit saying that this was actually um a sneaky plot by whoever made this app and uh at some point they're going to release an update with some malware and it's going to steal all of the bitcoins out of your mobile wallet <laughs> yeah um but okay, yeah, that's I think concerning. he's making enough money off of ads yeah i mean it's a sneaky plot for him to make money uh if it does come out that some kind of malware, I mean, hopefully Google is smart enough to kind of screen updates before, you know, malware gets included in them. I don't know how well, that there, whole process works. There are apps like there. I remember seeing this a while back. There are some like scam, scammy apps where, uh, where you can, once you install them, it hijacks your phone's uh, CPU and uses it to mine Bitcoin. Now, on your uh, phone? Yeah. Now that was a long time ago, so okay. I probably back when it was possible to do any significant mining on a on a on well, a phone. Well, when I say a long time ago, I mean like last year, like six oh. months ago, or something like that. Um, like actually, yeah, I think it was over the summer. So that's what I mean by a long time ago. Hmm. But I'm I'm sure, or I would hope that Google removed those, found them out, and removed them. But yeah, I remember reading this. A uh, big article about it. I just got a pet. Yeah, got my you first got a dog. Yeah. Hopefully he doesn't steal my bitcoins. <laughs> no, but yeah. Um, overall, like great, great design game, and I'm sure that this guy's making a ton of money on this, just yeah, I... based on ads. And you can choose to pay extra money for more hyper bits and bitcoins and stuff like that. So I'm sure I've given him tons of money because i watch an ad every time so every time double. i get something that i can double i watch an ad and uh those random events i always get the bad ones so i'm always watching ads so i don't <laughs> lose money <laughs> yeah this so, guy loves you you're making <laughs> him tons of money by watching yeah, these ads i spend just as much time watching ads as i do actually playing the game because i'm just so bad at picking stuff yeah nice and i mean i'm sure this guy is at least buying some bitcoin with his ad revenue so good for him good for him and genius genius guy genius developer maybe we should maybe we should design an app we should, some we should kind make of a game because when when this was first announced and i think when it was first came out on iphone and i heard about it i thought it was going to be more something like um like that maze runner game where you're a little guy running on an obstacle course and you got to like catch the coins um, on the sides, um, that's what I thought it was going to be, but it's it's not. You're just sitting and you're just tapping. There's no control of your character or anything like that. Yeah, there I've, might be some I, room for that type of app in the marketplace. I thought it was going to be something like, uh, you know, those apps where you're like a theme park manager or something, and you have to like set prices for things and zoo tycoon, you know, roller coaster tycoon, and stuff. Yeah, well, th those are like older computer games, but there's there are there's like mobile games where it's it's a similar concept. You you like you're like running a resort or some kind of theme park or something, and you just like m try to make it as successful as possible. That's what I thought Bitcoin Billionaire was going to be. Like you mm -hmm. were uh, like s the head of some kind of Bitcoin business, or you ran a mining farm or something. I didn't know it was just tapping on the screen, but that's. Mm -hmm. I mean, this little idle tapping game is just as fun as what I had pictured in my head. So I'm, I was pretty surprised by it. I thought it was gonna be really boring. I was like, who's just, 
when I found out what it really was, I was like, who wants to tap on a screen? You don't even get anything out of that, but I, I was wrong. <laughs> I'm addicted to There's it. There's always bits like exploding on the screen. They've got these crazy animations that just explode coins across the screen. It's like, it's dopamine hack for your brain. <laughs> it's genius. I mean, yeah, I'm I'm a little I'm a little bit like, kind of tuned into this type of marketing strategy already, just based on watching the South Park episode that came out a couple of weeks ago <laughs> where they lampooned freemium games. So it's like, oh, these are the strategies that they're using to uh, get people addicted to this. Um, but hey, whatever, you know, I'm, I'm willing to spend a little bit of time and finger power on this new addiction. Yeah, the, whatever they're doing, it works because I'm, I'm hooked and I will be for the next day or two, I guess. <laughs> oh, great. Cryptocurrencies were just declared illegal for zero point. <laughs> zero four seconds yeah, and you you lose one fourth of your bitcoin i always get those too yeah i'm about to lose one third of my bitcoins but instead i'll just watch an advertisement genius game it's, but yeah oh it's a great game i oh it's i hope they make more bitcoin games um i'm not a big mobile gamer this is the first mobile game i've played in like two years probably wow. uh, I, with the exception of flappy bird i got addicted to flappy bird for exactly oh, yeah. three glorious days glorious flappy bird yeah. and then i quit yeah uh if they make more bitcoin games i'll i'll definitely i'll definitely play them and it's it's also a again another good way to spread awareness because they got to number one on the app store uh for apple and when it came mm -hmm. out the day before yesterday on android it was already at number four and it was an editor's pick in the google play store wow so Very people nice. are just, they're seeing the word Bitcoin and they're playing the game. It's really fun. Maybe they might Google it, you know? Yeah, and it's getting great reviews as well. I mean, I think it has an average of 4.5 stars out of 5 on the Google Play Store. So um, great, great feedback. And uh, I, I think we've I think we've given enough praise on this to this game, <laughs> enough for today's podcast. Um, we'll close this out now. Uh, thank you guys for watching the 25th episode of the Coin Brief podcast. This is your open source for digital currency news. Um, follow us on Twitter. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Give us your comments in the comment se section below with your thoughts um, on these topics. And uh, visit coinbrief.net. Uh, and yeah, um, have a great week and look forward to us next week with some more news in the digital currency space. Thanks, guys.